Kjo ishte që a kishim për të thënë monitoruesit tonë të zgjedhjeve. E tash me mua është Tracy Ann Jacobson, ambasadoria Amerikane në Kosovë. Ms. Jacobson, welcome to our program. Um, first question. Um, lately, the United States seems to be doing more advising than insisting when it comes to our internal affairs. Are things really changing or things have remained the same behind the scenes? I came here at an interesting time in August of 2012, which was just on the eve of the end of supervised independence. And I think that really means something in Kosovo. And naturally, well, when Kosovo has achieved its full unsupervised independence, it's natural that embassies are going to have an evolving relationship with the government and the people. And I would say we're still very closely linked up. We still have uh, great contacts, access, collaboration. but. Uh, uh, Decisions are really up to the people of Kosovo to make. Um, you, you follow this election closely. How do you explain the switch over from the review of 2010 of being an industrial fraud uh, type of election to um, a largely free and fair one now? How do you explain this change? Well, I wasn't here in 2010, but I will say several elements came together to make a successful election. Uh, first of all, we had a new criminal code and criminal procedures code which placed more emphasis on electoral fraud and gave greater penalties to those kinds of crimes. Uh, we had the police and the uh, prosecutors empowered, uh, engaged in that from the beginning, even during the campaign. I believe there are 17 indictments from uh, December the 1st, and there were eight arrests. I'm sorry, November the 3rd. Mm -hmm. There were eight arrests on mm -hmm. December the 1st. Uh, so that showed, I think, the people that it was being taken seriously. That gave the voters more confidence. The voters played their role. They came out in large numbers. And the political party leaders also committed to uh, supporting a free and fair process. So it was a great result for Kosovo all around. Apart from this, um, have you followed the election campaign? What have you noticed that was... Um, uh, th that strike to you, that, that was new, although you haven't been here before, I understand that. Pa uh, mm -hmm. we uh, all have followed the campaign very closely. Mm -hmm. um, on election days themselves, on November the 3rd and on December the 1st, I had the privilege to travel around the country to visit dozens of polling stations to meet the poll workers. I was very impressed by the uh, efforts of the poll workers to be professional, but also the level of engagement in terms of the monitoring, not only from political parties, but also from civil society. For example, Democracy in Action, which my government supported along with the governments of the UK and, uh, and Norway. So I think uh, the monitoring effort was also a very important part of successful elections. And um, the quality of the politics and the campaign, what did you think about it? Here in Kosovo, there still is a tendency uh, for parties, I think, to be based on personalities, uh, maybe rather than political platforms, but that's evolving now. And I think one of the things that local people have told me is that candidates were more prepared in this election to speak about specific platform issues. For example, how they would spend their budgets if elected. The important thing now is for the elected candidates to follow through on those promises, to follow through on those platforms. Because if this election showed anything, it was that not only is Kosovo capable of conducting a free and fair elections, but that voters will hold their elected leaders accountable for the promises that they make during the campaign. Over 50% of the mayors in entire Kosovo changed, although the key result, the parties and uh, how they run it up remained the same, over 50% of mayors completely changed. What does it explain about Kosovo? Well, I think it explains that voters are uh, interested in having a voice in how their municipalities are run. They want to be a part of setting what the priorities are. They want to be a part of uh, deciding how the budget is spent. And they're going to insist on having that vote. What I hope it means for the future is that the elected mayors, the new mayors, or whether they're new or re-elected, will really listen to their constituents, really listen to their citizens, work collaboratively with the municipal assemblies, which are sometimes dominated by a different party, and uh, work collaboratively to really make progress on the goals of the citizens in their day-to-day -day life on the ground. That's what municipal elections are all about. Now, on your personal Twitter, which I followed, uh, you wrote yesterday that you are proud that the two mayors that have won, uh, Mimosa Kusori and Shmenda Ahmeti, are educated in the United States. 
Uh, one of them is in the Vendosia movement. Not long ago, you complained that the Vendosia injured you during a protest in front of the parliament building. Can you tell me what has happened in the meantime? Has the Vendosia changed? I don't think it has. At least uh, no one from Vet Vendosia has communicated to me that uh, they are no longer going to engage in the politics of uh, physical confrontation, which I don't think is appropriate. I am proud of our U.S. government exchange programs. Uh, the Ron Brown Fellows Program has produced so many great leaders in the Balkans. And uh, our educational exchanges here are a major part of what we do, both through the State Department's Public Diplomacy Office and an upcoming program uh, through USAID that's going to literally send hundreds of Kosovars to the United States for master's degrees and advanced technical certification. I think this is a great part of our cooperation and of course whenever any of our alumni take on a responsible position either in government or somewhere else in society we're proud of that contribution that we've made. I'm gonna push you a bit here because of the um, the role that US Embassy has had so far with uh, this movement. Now that uh, this a member of this movement has become uh, part of the institutions. I wonder, will you still uh, not uh, meet them because you don't agree with their politics or will you behave like uh, maybe the ambassador in, um, in Belgrade which meets, who meets nationalist uh, leaders even though they are nationalist uh, leaders in, in, in Serbia's politics? So I personally am happy to meet with any political leader uh, even if they have a radically different view from my own. Uh, that's, that's not the problem. And uh, Vet Fendosia's sort of uh, political position on the issues, uh, while in many cases differs from our own, that's not the reason that I haven't engaged the senior leadership. The reason is because of this, uh, the tactics of physical confrontation. But that having been said, my officers do meet with representatives of Vet Fendosia. We do have relationships on the working level, and that will continue. And I hope that we get to some stage in the future where Vet Fendosia will say we're no longer interested in uh, physical confrontation, that we're going to adopt a sort of mature approach to uh, our political aims and then we can have a discussion of what those aims are. By mature approach do you mean not protest um, in the parliament or outside? What do you mean? Can e we go everybody into more has details? a right to protest. I have mm -hmm. no problem with peaceful protest. What I have a problem with is physically blocking access to the parliament um, that's what happened to me. It was during a process of trying to physically prevent me from entering the parliament that the activists pushed me into a wall. Uh, that's not even the main story from that day, though. The main story from that day was them preventing the speaker of the parliament from doing his job by taking the microphone and occupying the seat. I don't think those are the behaviors of a, a mature democratic political party. Uh, on that day in particular, um, everyone who wanted to speak had the opportunity to get up and speak at length. Uh, that's where you have the opportunity to make your views known. It's a step too far to physically prevent somebody else from speaking. That's what I mean. Okay, this brings me to the other topic. Clearly we are pleased with our election, but in the meantime, have we allowed the internationals to twist our arm and give away half our country? Uh, and are we at the moment just too happy to see this? I'm talking about nine municipalities having won, uh, having been won by the Serbian list who has already declared that it does not recognize Kosovo's independence, it does not recognize Kosovo's institutions, and it will not accept one of its leaders, Christopher Pantic, uh, declared yesterday, it will not recognize Kosovo's symbols and our prime minister as its own. His prime minister will always be Dacic. Well, I think we have to look at the overall context in which these elections occurred. There is an ongoing dialogue in Brussels. Uh, prime Minister Dacic and Prime Minister Thaci will be there tomorrow to continue to discuss issues, including the uh, formation of this association of Serb-majority municipalities. We don't know exactly what shape it's going to take yet. We are looking forward to seeing the statute that defines how this association will operate, but we do know that the association will be created within the law and the constitution of Kosovo, and we do know that elections occurred within Kosovo law on the sovereign territory of all of Kosovo. Um, so that is the main picture. That's the first time that that has ever happened, that they were Kosovo elections under Kosovo law, and uh, that is the way the municipalities will have to operate going forward. But what did we get out of this? Uh, I'm, I'm 
I, I realize that now we have Serbian institutions, rather than having them separate, we might have them as a part of Kosovo, but, uh, but Kosovo institutions, but at the same time, it worries me what is happening in the South in places that have been institutionally, at least, integrated into the Republic of Kosovo. Are we setting ourselves for a miniature version uh, of, the, uh, of what is happening in the north to happen in the south of, uh, of the river, especially places like Gracianica and Novo Brdo join this municipality? Have we regressed the, le the rest of decentralized Kosovo, which has not proven to be a bad example of decentralization? Well, I don't think so. We have to keep in mind that uh, Serbia has supported health and education in the municipalities in the south as well, and that is allowed by Kosovo's constitution. It was envisioned under Atasari, and it's been part of the dialogue that's been going on and the agreement that was signed on April 19th, which uh, allows Serbia to continue to have a, a relationship with Serb-majority municipalities as long as the financial flows are transparent. And I think this is an important point because we know, especially in the north of Kosovo, that the non-transparent uh, provision of funding has meant that a lot of the funding that should have been earmarked for health and education has gone to enrich individuals. And through a more transparent process, hopefully those funds that come from Serbia for health and education will actually reach the people that need those funds. But, With, but let, me, and let me continue, if, if you'll just mm -hmm. let me finish. With regard to the association, uh, we don't know exactly, as I said, what form it will take, but we do know that it will allow municipalities to collectively exercise those responsibilities that are already under Kosovo law delegated to municipalities. That is the responsibility that they'll have. And maybe more, because as you said, we are uncertain. We have allowed for a dialogue to take place this long, and the only reason why we entered it was to integrate the North, and that is uncertain at the moment because we don't know uh, what the statute of the association occurs. We didn't get, what do you say to the critics who say that uh, not only from this dialogue did we get visa liberalization, not only did we get not get five non-recognizers to uh, recognize Kosovo, but we also have uncertainty over how the association is going to look, but now we know they've got nine winners inside Kosovo. What do you say to critics who think this is a recipe for a Trojan horse, a type of Republika Srpska within Kosovo? Well, I would encourage them not to panic. After all, we don't know what the statute is going to look like, but we do know that the association will not have responsibilities or executive competencies, if you want to call them that, beyond those which are already uh, how, delegated. How do you know if we have well, a this, statute? This is, uh, this is something that uh, has been agreed in the April 19th agreement and a point on which I believe the European Union, which is facilitating this dialogue, has been quite clear that the, uh, the competencies are limited to those already uh, delegated to municipalities under Kosovo law and under the Constitution. What, what do you envisage is going to happen uh, previewing this to national elections? What happens when we get Serbian Citizens Initiative uh, in MPs in the parliament? At the moment, they have reserve seat, 10 reserve seat, even before they get out of bed. Uh, with this result, if uh, same municipal result, similar result, they may become one of the key parties, one of the big, biggest five, six parties in Kosovo. Uh, having a Serbian uh, dominated uh, a Belgrade, uh, a Belgrade dominated party, be a part of Kosovo's decision making, central parliament decision making in the future. What does this um, say for Kosovo? Well, let's back up from the hypothetical uh, elections that may occur sometime in 2014 and look at what's going to happen now. We've got uh, mayors from various different parties who are going to have to deal with municipal assemblies, who have a lot of power in the municipalities, particularly over the budget, who are from different parties. It means that all of these mayors, whether they're from Srpska or from uh, whatever party they might be from, are going to have to work as part of a diverse political spectrum. But the mayor has a lot of powers too. In, in our system, the mayors can get a lot of things through without asking the assembly. Uh, indeed, they can, but in terms of who controls the budget process, who finally approves that, any mayor is not going to be able to act in a vacuum. And particularly, these elections showed that the mayors are going to have to be accountable 
to the populations that they've been elected to serve. And this is something that I want to point out here. I want to have a little switch about from the power of mayors to the responsibility of mayors. Uh, from the sort of focus on the elected official as an important person to their role in serving a community. That's, I think, a real key takeaway from this election for me. And that's going to be true of mayors from the Serbska party. It's also going to be true of mayors from PDK or LDK or uh, AAK or um, Sven Dakmedi from Vet Vendosia. Mm -hmm. They will be responsible to the citizens. And I think that message has been really brought home in a new way by the number of changes that occurred as a result of this election. However, talking about the Serbian minority, should we admit that it has not shown the capacity to maybe uh, make its own decision? In a sense, we formerly had uh, SLS, which was viewed by its own population as a puppet party of Pristina. Now we have uh, Srpska Lista, which is viewed from the way civil servants were made to vote in the north, as viewed as the, the puppet of Belgrade party. Should we admit that neither Atisari plan that envisaged powers to minority that decides for itself, this is just too ambitious for, uh, for the situation of, of the Serb minority in, in, in Kosovo? Well, I don't think it's uh, too ambitious, and I would uh, not sort of look at uh, the situation in that sort of lens that you're describing it. I, we have to think of both Belgrade and Pristina as partners in a process of dialogue, as partners in implementing the April 19th agreement. Both Belgrade and Pristina have an interest in seeing that work, not only for uh, the benefit of the situation on the ground, but also for their European aspirations. We know that uh, Belgrade wants to start accession talks for the EU. Uh, we've seen that Kosovo has already started negotiations for the Stabilization and Association Agreement, which is a great achievement. Uh, earlier you mentioned we haven't got this, we haven't got that. Well, yeah. Stabilization I'm and Association Agreement, despite the fact that there's non-recognizers, I think is a great progress. And that should be concluded, I think, successfully sometime next year. So that is also an important step in Kosovo's further uh, integration it, with isn't Europe. Isn't it unfair, a little bit unfair? It's very minimalist that we got MSA, but the fact that all we got out of it is the uncertainty of whether these municipalities will respect the law or not. We still don't know. We haven't seen it. And what Serbia got out of it is um, accession, uh, accession to, to the EU. Um, well, they haven't got their, fair? they haven't got an accession start date yet. That mm -hmm. is only going to be decided by the European Council on the 17th of December. And accession is a process. There are some 35 chapters that need to be open and closed. Each time you open and close a chapter, uh, that requires the uh, consensus and consent of all the members of the European Union. So the process of Serbia's accession to the EU uh, is one that's rather complex and intense. And it also includes relationship with the neighbors, including Kosovo. So that's... Uh, so this dialogue, you think, uh, by, by, by the uh, speak of it, is going to be endless an endless dialogue to see how uh, they behave with the nine municipalities. It's, n uh, it's a never-ending dialogue. I think dialogue should never end. I think countries that live next to each other that share a border must always be in dialogue. In terms of the EU facilitation of this dialogue, I think it's been very productive. And I think that uh, both sides have agreed that elections and the association will uh, take place and be created within the context of Kosovo law. That's already uh, a big step forward. In terms of how long this political dialogue goes into, what shape it takes in the future, what uh, form or who is facilitating it, you know, I can't say. But at the same time, I think it's, uh, it's an important improvement. It's something that I wouldn't have imagined before I came here, that you would have the prime ministers of Kosovo and Serbia regularly sitting down and making decisions and making sometimes painful compromises to improve the life for their people and to improve their European perspective. So I look at that as a positive. And possibly maybe go back on our uh, already uh, painfully, painfully negotiated decentralization uh, package of Atisari. We've been here before in terms of negotiating uh, packages like this. So what do you say to the fact that we constantly have to compromise and give in and, and actually some critics feel getting not much out of it? I think Kosovo's gotten a lot out of this dialogue process. It's gotten a lot 
further along in terms of normalization of its relationship with Serbia. The perception of Kosovo as a country on the international stage has been dramatically improved through this process. And as I mentioned, Kosovo got the Stabilization and Association Agreement. Um, so I think those are all positive benefits. Uh, and I hope that we're going to see more positive benefits as we go forward into 2014. As we have uh, better integrated border management, I hope that will open up the opportunities for more cross-border trade. Uh, I hope it will take an element of political risk away for potential investors who might have felt uncomfortable about coming here before, but now we'll see that this process of dialogue is a positive political development. So there are a lot of benefits to the dialogue. In terms of the price that's been paid, I would just reemphasize that when we talk about decentralization to municipalities, uh, when we talk about the April 19th agreement, there are no authorities that are being delegated to municipalities beyond those which are already enshrined in Kosovo's law. Um, apart from the fact that this mayor now, one of the leading mayors, is declaring it will not accept Kosovo institutions and Kosovo symbols and Kosovo emblems. Isn't that a beginning of a quite um, a, a little um, dispute to, to have an, an opening for a type of Republika Srpska? I what think it would be a mistake to pay too much attention to what politicians say immediately following an electoral victory. And I think we have to see how this process plays out. We'll have the meeting with the prime ministers on the 5th. I understand they'll probably meet again in December. And uh, since both Belgrade and Pristina have committed that uh, the structure of the new municipalities, uh, the way the association will work, will be in accordance with Kosovo law, uh, that is the important starting point, and that's uh, all the municipalities are, will eventually have to work well, on that basis. I have a couple of questions about which you just mentioned investment. That, rather than dialogue, is one of the key concerns. The economic underdevelopment of Kosovo is one of the key concerns of majority of population. I've seen you recently be in an inauguration of, of uh, our, our uh, national highway being opened, and I want to ask you about the government contract that, uh, with Bechtel Enka Consortium which is not yet public. In the meantime, another s state contract we have with Turkish-French consortium in the International Pristina uh, Airport has become public. The civil society has been pushing to see uh, the contract signed with Bechtel Engta and, and when asked from the Ministry of, former Minister of Transport, he has said that this contract, uh, it would be revealing um, business secrets. Nevertheless, does the U.S. government, I want to ask you in terms of, by, in principle, does the U.S. government allow secrecy over state road uh, building contracts? How would you evaluate the non-publication of, of this contract and the need of the public to actually scrutinize and see this contract? Well, I really don't think that that's a decision on which the United States Embassy in Kosovo has a vote. This is up to the government and civil society to work out. I, I will say that uh, the road is a fantastic project. It's won multiple international awards. It's a pleasure for me to drive on, and I really think it will help link up Kosovo in terms of people-to-people -people relations and also trade. Uh, then with, what's the problem about making it trans this contract transparent? Well, this is not a question you should be asking me. Uh, this is not in my it's area of company. responsibility. Uh, it's an American Turkish consortium, uh, which uh, has always acted in a manner that's very above board. They've made a, 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 a proposal on the latest bid on, on Route 6, uh, which I understand came um, uh, 200 million euros uh, under the competitor and also received 20 points higher in terms of the technical evaluation. So I think they prepared a very good proposal. In terms of uh, uh, how those uh, proposals are compared and how they are um, analyzed, that's really up to the government of Kosovo. This is, uh, in terms of American investment, this is a contractor. It's an American company, but it's a contractor doing a service for our government that our budget is paying for it. But can you explain to me why we don't see more U.S. Uh, uh, companies investing, foreign direct investment in Kosovo? What would it take for Kosovo to get them? Apart from what you said, the, the northern question, um, which may be encouraging, what else does this investor um, need for a foreign direct investment from the U.S. to grow? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, first, we have to remember that most of the world is coming out of a financial crisis and that investment dollars are short and that investors are probably a bit more conservative with their investments than they were during the days 
when uh, there was more money flowing around. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, what Kosovo can do to improve its attractiveness as a destination for investment is to get a handle on the corruption problem and the perceptions of corruption and enhance the capacity of the judiciary. We know that there's a backlog of cases and the uh, investors want to know that if they have a business dispute, they're going to be able to have it arbitrated in a quick and fair way. So these are two areas that would be uh, helpful in attracting foreign direct investment from the United States and elsewhere. And these are two areas where we're also uh, having a lot of our assistance with the government of Kosovo through Department of Justice, through USAID, uh, through our Treasury Has Department. Has this process really fast, uh, made itself faster in the sense that you have been investing in the system for a while, the system has changed this year uh, in hope that uh, the, the, the cases will be uh, much quick, uh, quicker pr uh, processed, but as a result, have we seen much quicker progress? Well, I actually think we have. We've seen, for example, in the World Bank ease of doing business report, for the last two years, Kosovo's gone up 39 places, which is a tremendous achievement. And I am happy to say that we had some small role in that through our business enabling environment project. Uh, we've also... Uh, but not because of courts. We were talking about courts. I agree that, that that's what's happened, but in, it's in terms not of in the courts. courts we've, uh, we've helped the government to introduce uh, 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 alternative dispute resolution, which can help shave some of that backlog. Uh, we've also, through Department of Justice, worked with the courts on plea bargaining, uh, which is a tool that we use in the United States to help manage the number of cases. And our support on the law of courts, the new law on courts, which came into effect this year, plus our continued training with police and prosecutors, I think is a reasonable contribution. And we do believe that we are seeing uh, the results of that. We've now seen in Kosovo the first plea bargains. We've now seen the first com uh, confiscations of uh, ill-gotten gains uh, from crime. So uh, that's progress. On, on the final topic, France recently announced the withdrawal of its uh, troops in order to deal with uh, commitments in Africa. What does the future hold for the U.S. troops, uh, U.S. deployment in bond steel in particular? We are still strongly committed to the K-4 mission here. I think uh, the elections have shown uh, that uh, K-4 can play a useful and stabilizing role in creating a safe and secure environment. Uh, I have had the opportunity to speak with uh, General Breedlove, who was here for our Thanksgiving holiday with the troops. Uh, I speak regularly with Admiral Klingon, and I know that uh, NATO as a whole is committed to uh, having a presence in Kosovo that's appropriate for the conditions, and that drawdown will only take place when conditions uh, raise it. And certainly that's the U.S. perspective as well. Uh, we are here, we're strongly supportive. At some point, I hope we reach a situation in Kosovo's development and the security situation that such a large international security present will no, presence will no longer be needed. But for now, um, we're, we're committed. I want to ask you, from the standpoint of the U.S., how real is the threat of terrorism and Islamic extremism here? Because so far, we haven't seen anything more from the Islamists here rather than thuggery. But the authorities have claimed that they have foiled terrorist plots. What do you think? What is, the, is there an Islamic threat in Kosovo? They did arrest six uh, individuals uh, last month uh, who had apparently been planning terrorist activities, who had been collecting, engaging in um, the Does buying and selling of weapons. So I think that in itself is a sign that this is an area uh, where we all need to be conscious. Uh, the government of Kosovo, the international community, it's not a unique problem to Kosovo, I don't think, but it's a, it, it is a problem throughout Europe. Regarding this, these arrests in particular, has the U.S. helped with information? This was an activity, as I understand, that was executed by the Kosovo police. And yeah. our assistance to the Kosovo police is based in sort of, in terms of training. But this was, uh, this was a job that was executed by Kosovo, and it seems like they did a good job. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jacobson, for being on our program. Thank you. Um, you do talk even <laughs> faster than I do. So. Thank you.